How did you get started on writing? Oh, I'd always had an idea that I wanted to be in the theatre. I wanted yeah. to be an actress. Yeah. I didn't think of writing at those days, although I did have a lively imagination. Being an only child and being yes. left alone, I used to make up stories for my own pleasure. Yeah. There was a desperate shortage of scripts at the BBC, because there was only the BBC. And I was in a play with Joy Harrington, mm -hmm. who was a well-known director, but she was acting in those days. And she said, we're desperate for scripts. Why the hell don't you write me something? So I did, and it was bought by Cecil Madden. It was a children's serial. And within three months, I had seven programmes on. Blimey. They were so short of writers. And you wrote the first interracial kiss in television in the world. I did, yes. Why? Well, it just was a story I'd written. Yeah. A, a coloured girl fell in love with a white boy and naturally they kissed. It's, it's what goes on in life. Are you going to pretend that this doesn't happen. Yeah. And they saw my point. First black key character in a, on British television. That was yours too. Yes. How did that all come to pass? Well, it was part of the story. I, you know, I developed things from a storyline and it required a, a black actor. And it seemed Ordinary. Natural. Natural is the word, yes. Yes. True to life. And did other people think it was natural? I don't know. It caused a bit of a hoo-ha, because that sort of thing mm. wasn't shown on television in those days. So it did create a bit of a stir. Mm. But it worked, and people liked it. It worked, and people liked it. And somebody said you developed sort of gay storylines before they invented the word. Oh, yes. Not that you um, called it that in those days. No, it what was, was just it? What? a way of acting and yeah. <laughs> carrying on. Yeah. But, um, I mean, if one's writing a soap, one portrays what goes on in life. How did you get to do what we now call dreaming up the concept of whole series of program ideas, a compact, a woman's magazine? How did that come to happen? I happened to, uh, at that time, write odd articles for women's magazines. And I was sitting in uh, reception waiting to see the editor of one, and watching and listening and everything. And I thought, this is a very interesting Melia. Uh, yes. This could be something. And by a strange stroke of fate, I got a phone call from Eric Mashwitz the very next day, who I'd known yeah. in the business for a long time, and he said, um, would you like to come and have lunch with me? So I thought I'd love to because he's a very amusing person. And I went and he said, um, you've been to America, haven't you? And I said, yes. He said, did you ever see any of the soap operas there? I said, yes. And he said, right, I want one. How quickly can you deliver me one? Just like that. And I, well, I went off my food after that. I couldn't finish the meal. And he had it by the following week. Who ran the world of the BBC and who ran the world of ITV? Oh, it was quite extraordinary. I mean, the BBC was frightfully gentlemanlike and so on. And you'd go over to an ITV studio and it was watch a cock and, you know, completely different atmosphere. And people 
got by by hard graft and talent in, in ITV, whereas you were sort of promoted by seniority at the BBC in the early days. But you see, in those days, it was only the BBC when one started, BBC television. Mm. And so there weren't a great number of people working at any one time. And everybody, of course, would congregate in the BBC club yep. for, yep. Uh, to relax after. So you got to know quite well a lot of people. The BBC club? What was that like? Cheap drinks. Cheap drinks. <laughs> and, and you lots. had people like Johnny Spate, who was permanent bar proper, you know, yes. him, and who used to cry <laughs> because he was very soulful character and he used, yes. to, he used to get solidly more and more yeah. drunk and he'd cry when he did and he'd, oh, he said, oh, you know, I said, what's the trouble today? And he was Johnny Spate who gave us Steptoe. Step yes. You worked with Lou Gray, didn't you? What was that like? Well, I got on very well with him. A lot of people were terrified out of their wits. Uh, but uh, uh, he didn't frighten me, and he was always very, very kind. What were the pay and conditions of writers in TV and radio like then? The average fee was a pound, a pound uh, a minute, I think it was. So to write a 60-minute drama slot, you got 60 quid. The established writers just wouldn't touch television. And also, one has to say, the production wasn't very good in those days yeah. because all the technicians were makey learnies, you know. And um, yeah. I went to see Lou Grade, uh, who was, I think, quite well disposed towards me because, you know, various programs I'd done for him had done well. And I, I thumped his desk and I said, it's a disgrace what you pay us. And he looked at me, no one had ever spoken to him like that before. And I said, there are people working on the same programs, like the Avengers and so on, uh, American writers who are getting royalties. And the British writers are getting half their fees and no royalties. It isn't fair, and I'm going to call a strike. And he said, you'd never call a strike. I said, I would, and I did. Blimey. <laughs> so what happened? There was a, a, a uh, TV writer's writer strike. All writers down tools for six weeks. He, he caved in very quickly. 